We support efforts to end mass incarceration, homelessness, environmental harm, and so much more. We believe in working towards fostering communities that support the well being and freedom for all. Partnering with SVPLA means taking the time to hear one another's stories and learn the truths of systemic injustice. It's about building an intersectional community and using our individual and collective power to liberate all people. It's about reimagining a future for all people, especially those who our systems have harmed, are seen, supported, and have the resources they need to not just survive, but to feel free. This is your invitation to show up and be a part of a collective vision. If you've been looking for a way to connect, to learn, to contribute to what you know our city and our world could look like, this community is for you. To find out how you can partner with us, visit svpla.org. We all have a role to play in this path towards freedom and systemic transformation. At SVPLA, we're here to roll up our sleeves and do the work right alongside you. Hello. How is everyone doing today? Welcome to Black Power. I am so excited that we are beginning this eight-week journey. I'm so happy to see so many people who have joined from all over. Um, it's been a real joy seeing people register and seeing where they're coming from. We have someone register who lives in Poland. What? So exciting. Um, hi, my name is Yolanda Enoch, and I am the manager of sustainable operations here at SVP. A little bit about us. We are a small but mighty team committed to liberation in all its forms. We facilitate trainings, lead programs, and make grants in service of racial, economic, and social justice. In purchasing this course, you're not only investing in your anti-racism journey, you're also investing in Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and our nonprofit's work to fund, support, and spotlight powerful systems change work led by BIPOC and proximity community leaders right here in Los Angeles. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. Yes, this is being recorded and a transcript will be available um, and we post it more likely on Friday. Um, we, a couple of things, if you want to be in community, I already see people in the chat and they're talking to each other. So feel free to continue to do that. As Dr. Abdullah goes through um, the education and the, the training and educating us on Black Power. If you have a question at any point, please use the Q&A feature to ask your question. That'll help us keep them separate. Um, and we will be happy to answer questions, um, but please use the Q&A feature. There's also a live transcript button down at the bottom. You'll see where it says live transcript. And if you click on that, it'll give you the option if you want to see captions while we are talking. Um, I would love to um, give a special shout out to Pro Bono ACL. We have Ashley McHenry and Dresden Lamar who are tag teaming the um, American Sign Language interpretation for us and I appreciate them so much. Um, and we are, I think that's it. If you have any technical issues or questions, look out for me in the panelists section, Yolanda Enoch or Ali Simon, um, you can send us a private message and we will help you work out any technical issues. But I think that's it. Welcome again. And I am going to hand it off to my colleague, Ali, who was instrumental in getting this, suggesting this course, and then also begging Dr. Abdullah to do it for us. So I'm so happy. And um, Ali, I will pass it off to you. Perfect, thank you so much, Yolanda. Hi, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. 
a uh, shout out to Pro Bono ASL for, uh, for really bringing and making this course accessible in all the ways needed. And uh, Dr. Abdullah for showing up and being in this. And so I won't talk too long because I know we want to get into now and, and the next eight, eight weeks. Um, but just I wanted to start off by just uh, thanking you all for being here and also introducing uh, Dr. Uh, Molina Abdullah. So Molina Abdullah is professor and former uh, department chair of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. She earned her PhD from USC in political science and BA from Howard uh, in African American Studies. As many of you already know, Dr. Abdullah is among the, the original group of organizers that convened to form Black Lives Matter and continues to serve um, as a Los Angeles chapter lead policy team lead for the California chapters and contribute to leadership for the global network. Um, Melina is originally from Oakland, um, but is in LA right now with us. Uh, and we are so, so grateful for all the leadership and all the, all the, all the work she does here. Um, she's also a single mom of three children and, and yeah, I'm just really excited and I won't speak too much more because I, I, I can tend to ramble, especially when I get nervous when I'm in the presence of folks who I admire. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it right off to Melina and uh, welcome. Well, hello everybody and thank you, Ali. Thank you, Yolanda. I'm grateful to have the space and um, was excited when Ali reached out Many of you know that I taught a class online um, during the pandemic. Many of us were forced to kind of teach online and I prefer to be in person and build space in person. But I figured as long as we are online, we might as well make this a truly open class. And so we had a class called Black Power that I normally teach at Cal State LA that was offered to everyone and thousands of you all all around the globe joined that class. Um, and so I'm grateful for the way that technology can be used to um, open up conversations so that we have people from all around the globe joining. I don't wanna belabor this too long with kind of that history and that um, the, the kind of technical aspects and how we're moving, but I am grateful. I do wanna uh, express my thanks to Ali and to Social Venture Partners Los Angeles for offering this class and for doing it in a way that's truly collaborative with Black Lives Matter, with Pro Bono ASL. Um, and I'm also thankful, I wanna shout out Tyler Boudreau who's helping me with um, tech issues on this side as you would have it. Um, our Wi-Fi is actually out at my house and so I'm trying to use a hot spot and hoping that goes well, but so far so good. Um, so I did have, as we get into Black Power, I did have a planned presentation for you all um, that I had been working on for the last couple of weeks. And then yesterday we got the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. And so kind of what I had planned to share with you um, was reworked significantly, right? Um, cost me my sleep last night, but I think it's really important that we seize the time in the words of Bobby Seale and really kind of engage in a way that's organic in this moment. So I'm going to be talking about Black Power and introducing the concepts of Black Power. There is a syllabus that will have um, suggested readings for you all. I hope that everyone will pick up the book Black Power by Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton will pick up the book Freedom Dreams by Robin Kelly, and will also read When They Call You a Terrorist by Patrice Cullors. Those three texts are going to be guiding our conversation, but you won't be off if you haven't read. This is not, you're not registered in a university class. This is a class that you chose to engage in. And so if life gets ahead of you and you're not able to read, we'll still have conversation in a way that engages you. And so I wanted to start this conversation just by defining black power and talking about why it's important that we think in terms of black power. I know not everyone in this class is black and that's okay. Um, black power also requires the investment 
of non-Black allies. And so we're inviting you into the work, into the work of Black freedom struggle as an ally and an accomplice um, to Black liberation. And so all of us must be invested in this work. And so we're going to kind of move in that way. I want to um, begin by sharing, oh, here it is, okay. I'm on someone else's computer because again, technical difficulties, right? Um, I wanna share the screen with you and um, good. And I think you can still see pro bono ASL if I share the screen, right? Yes, okay. Um, so I want to talk about Black power, and I want us to understand what we mean by Black power. But before we get into the, that kind of conversation, every class, we're going to ground ourselves because the world tries to move so quickly that it often dictates our agenda. It often kind of um, mandates a certain energy. It steals our time, and it appropriates our spirit. And so we're gonna begin each class by grounding ourselves deliberately, um, grounding down into uh, the space that we're in, but also the legacy that we inherit. So we're gonna do something that I call a land labor and life acknowledgement. I know many of us are used to doing land acknowledgements as an African person, as an African person in this country, it's really important that we also acknowledge our African ancestors who built this country and whose lives were sacrificed um, in the process. And um, so I wanna both acknowledge the land, but also acknowledge the labor and lives. Um, so I'm gonna ask for volunteers and there are three slides. If we could get three people to raise their hands um, one reading each slide. So do we have anybody who's willing to read this first slide? If you would like to read the slide, raise your hand. It's down in the bottom menu and I will add you as a panelist. So first up, we got Seva. Hi, Seva is your name? Can you repeat your name? Can she, can you hear Hi. me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, hi. Oh, Saba. Hi, Saba. My name uh, is Sa Saba Mune. Saba, hi, Saba. Can you just give us a quick introduction of yourself? Your name is Saba. Mwine. It's I think it's misspelled on it's M as in Mary, W-I-N-E. But but yes, my uh, my name is Saba. Uh, I am an African woman. I uh, am a mom. I live in Los Angeles. I uh, do work at the intersection of race and homelessness. And I am so excited to volunteer. I didn't expect to get a chance to like, you know, be on screen and, you know, talk to you like this. So thank you very much. Uh, so shall I read the slide? Yes, please. And if you could okay. have us take a breath first. Oh, yes. Okay. So if we could just uh, ground our feet, if we're able to be, if everyone is, for those of us that are able to sit, um, just go ahead and make sure your feet are flat on the ground. Go ahead and um, allow your spine to have its natural its natural poise. And let's, how about take three breaths together. I'm closing my eyes. You can keep your eyes open. And so whenever you're ready, um, go ahead and take a deep, we're gonna take a deep inhale and I'm going to do it right now. Inhale. And then exhale out of our mouths. And let's do two more. Inhale through your nose. And let it out, out your mouth with sound. <sighs> and one more, inhale through your nose. And out through your mouth. <sighs> Breath. This land that we inhabit is physically situated 
in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all the indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. Thank you, thank you. I'm trying to figure out why I can't find my cursor. There it is, okay. Yeah. Who do we have next who can read the next slide? Thank you, Saba. Looking for another volunteer. Oh, I see when someone's just raised their hand, who is it? Nicole, all right, Nicole, I am gonna move you over. Hi. Hi, Nicole, can you introduce yourself before you start? Yep, my name is Nicole Taylor. I'm here in Philadelphia. I'm happy to be with you today and happy to learn. Thank you. And if we could take a deep breath in and breathe out. And Nicole, if you could start with We Pay Homage. Mm -hmm. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel and forced into labor, who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors and the still unpaid labor, which built what is now the Americas. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Do we have another volunteer for this last slide? I think we saw Becky's hand go up. Yolanda, are you talking? Yes, Becky's here, I think. Great. And so Hi. if we can take a deep breath in. Oh, go ahead, Becky, introduce yourself and then we'll take the breath. Sure, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Becky Avila. I am from Los Angeles. I'm a Latina, and I'm very excited to be here today. Great. And if we could take a deep breath in and breathe out. And go ahead, Becky, with to both our. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Aho, Ashi, I'm sorry if I'm doing that such a disservice. No, Aho, Ashe, that's how we pronounce it, Aho, Ashe. And those are just- Aho, Ashe. Yes, those are just affirmations. It's like saying Amen or Amin. It's just an affirmation. Thank you, Becky. Thank you to everyone who volunteered. We're gonna ask that we kind of rotate this so everybody has an opportunity to participate, to kind of ground us. So think about whether or not you're gonna be one of the readers next week. Um, but every week we're going to um, begin with this grounding, begin with this land, labor and life acknowledgement. It's a stealing back of our time, our energy, our spirit and getting into this conversation in a way that's intentional. And so I would have done introductions, but I'm looking at the time and I don't want to um, do that now, but I would love for you to think about these questions. Of course, you know your name. Um, I'd also like you to think about your pronoun if you come from an organization and then think about why you're taking this class. What led you to make this decision to take this class? Um, and we'll kind of get back to some of these questions as we move through 
the eight weeks, but we like to be in community. And I know that that's not always possible through a one hour webinar, but this should be a collective process. If we're talking about black power, it's not possible for one person or even a handful of people to kind of lead that conversation. We all have to be engaged and take it on as kind of a collective educational process. That's also core and foundational to my discipline. So I teach in Pan-African Studies. Pan-African Studies is one of the only disciplines that's grounded in community. We didn't come from an ivory tower. We didn't come from institutional power. Pan-African Studies, Black Studies, and all ethnic studies came out of the struggles of the streets. And so we know in 1968, it was the students at San Francisco State University that rose up in partnership and in uh, solidarity with what was moving during the Black Power era in solidarity with the Black Panther Party, in solidarity with the Third World Liberation Front. And so it is through that practice and praxis that Pan-African Studies and Black Studies came to be. So this class, this Black Power class, which is grounded in my discipline in Pan-African Studies, really recognizes that we are here to develop intellectual tools that move us forward, that they are intellectual tools for the revolution. And that's what we're here to do. We are not here to um, intellectually masturbate. We are not here to simply engage in readings that help us to kind of um, have something more that we can claim to hold on to for our individual selves. We are here to gain intellectual tools that are to be used in the process of liberation. And so again, we are centering Blackness and this is a Black power class. Some people ask, why do we say we're centering Blackness? Why Black power, right? You've heard people lift this up. You know that I'm an organizer with Black Lives Matter. You've heard many times people say, why do we say Black Lives Matter? Why not? the dreaded all lives, right? Well, we have to remember that Black people stand at the very bottom of virtually every single social, political, and economic measure. And not because we have some sort of, we're not deficient, right? We are not less than, but we are at the bottom of these measures by design. And so it's really important that we understand that the way in which we usher in freedom is not by lifting up a few at the top. It's not by even seeking to emulate those who um, benefit from systems of oppression. It's by toppling systems that intentionally were designed to produce the outcomes that they do. It's by being willing to say, I'm an abolitionist. And in this moment, in this movement moment, we know that abolition is absolutely necessary. And so we're gonna talk a bit about the verdict that came out yesterday and about the right to celebrate, the right to breathe a sigh of relief, and also to recognize that the verdict that makes, that affirms that Derek Chauvin is a murderer also um, is not enough. It wasn't enough to save the life of Makia Bryant, right? It wasn't enough to save the life of Adam Toledo. It wasn't enough to save the life of Anthony Thompson or of Dante Wright or of all of the others whose names you don't know, right? It wasn't enough because only by abolishing, only by upending unjust systems, are we able to move towards liberation? Are we able to move towards freedom? The other side of abolition and the reason that we're reading and I'm encouraging you to read Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreams is abolition is absolutely about upending unjust systems. And it's also about daring to vision and build towards new systems, daring to think about what a public safety system could look like if we abolish the police, right? Daring to think about what our educational system could look like if we move away from models of education that are really grounded in an oppressive schooling system, right? 
daring to imagine what a medical system could look like if we upend medical apartheid and medical racism, right? And so abolition means the upending of unjust systems and the building, the visioning, and the ushering in of new ones and re re reminding ourselves that those new systems, those just systems have to be grounded in black freedom because when black people get free, we all get free, right? There is a role for you though, if you are a non-black person of color. We have to remember that many of the things that black people experience when we think about housing discrimination, when we think about this pandemic moment, when we think about educational oppression, right? that we experience alongside other people of color, right? A lot of times people are unable now to uh, decouple black folks from brown folks, right? So you hear people very rapidly say in black and brown communities, well, we wanna make sure that we don't um, collapse the two because we do have unique experiences. But I think one of the reasons that people speak in terms of black and brown is because there is so much that we experience alongside each other. We live in the same neighborhoods. We attend the same schools. We often experience the same racism. So as we lift up the names of those whose lives were stolen um, over the course of just the last couple of weeks, we can't say those names without talking about 13 year old seventh grader Adam Toledo, right? We can't talk about why we have to remove police from traffic stops without talking about Daniel Hernandez, whose life was stolen here in Los Angeles when the daughter of the police association head, her name is Tony McBride, stole his life in the aftermath of a car accident, right? And so people of color have to be invested in upending unjust systems across people of color, right? Um, both because we share space, sometimes we share DNA, we are not mutually exclusive categories. We have to remember that African people, in fact, more African people went to Latin America, were brought to Latin America as enslaved people than actually were brought to the United States. And so when we say Latinx folks, we're also talking about many of whom are African Latinx folks, right? And most recently, we've been talking about the role of Asian Americans who had been assigned by white supremacy, this identity as a model minority. We have to remember that that was an assignment that was intentionally imposed to divide people of color, right? We have to remember that the true relationships among people of color have been primarily, primarily ones of solidarity, cooperation and coalition. So as we think about um, leaders like Frederick Douglass who were outspoken against the Chinese Exclusion Act, lifting up parallels between the treatment of African people in the United States and the treatment of Chinese folks, we need to remember that despite the assignment imposed by white supremacy, people of color are seen as people of color and are at the bottom of the social and racial hierarchy. Um, and then finally, when we talk about indigenous folks, right? We often talk about, and I said that black people are at the bottom of virtually every social, political and economic measure. There are some where we kind of buy for that bottom rung with indigenous folks, right? And Black folks and Indigenous folks have had a long-standing relationship. And so it's really important that we, as we talk about this country being built on the stolen land of Indigenous people and the stolen lives and labor of Black people, we understand also what it means to be in, united and struggle to upend the system of neo-colonialism that continues to rule. Finally, we want to talk about the role of white folks, right? that just because you benefit from white supremacy, and I know that's a hard pill to swallow, lots of white folks go, I don't wanna say I benefit from white supremacy. Let me say this, this is not an assignment of blame or guilt, unless you accept the system as you inherited it. Your job as white people is to engage even more vigorously than the rest of us 
and upending a system that benefited you. You receive undue benefits because we live under a white supremacist system. You didn't have to sign up for it. Just by virtue of being white, you receive undue benefits. You receive unearned privileges. And so we're asking you to also step into the struggle for black freedom, step into the struggle for liberation, step into the struggle for black empowerment because it falls on your shoulders too. And so as we talk about centering blackness, it doesn't mean that we're asking any of you to step away from who you are, but it's calling on you to assess who you are and assess what you can do to actually usher in black freedom. I hope that makes sense. And I wanna pause there before we go on to the rest of the conversation to see if there's any questions. So please use the raise hand function if there are any thoughts or questions around what I just shared. And I'm terrible at looking at the chat because I sometimes say that I'm still 29, but my eyes will tell you the truth and I can't read a chat while um, <laughs> we're in this class. So if there are questions, please raise your hand so we can bring you on screen. Or comment. Seems like we don't have anything. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next thing then. Um, so as we talk about black power, it's important that we define what black power is. And Huey P. Newton, who I hope many of you know, um, was a co-founder of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. He and Bobby Seale, founded the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California in October 1966. And as a Black power organization, and we have to remember what 1966 is, right? Um, 1965 really marked the close of the civil rights era, era and the transitioning in of the Black power era. In 1965, we saw the passage of the Voting Rights Act right, it comes on the heels of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If we think about what the civil rights movement is, the civil rights movement was really about saying how can black people and other people of color gain access to the system as it exists, right? So civil rights is about encouraging governmental intervention to assure the rights of the people, right? So if you think about what was happening in places like Birmingham, Alabama, places like Selma, places like Mississippi, right? If we think about what was happening, black people especially were being blocked from our fundamental rights, largely by local governments and white supremacist organizations. So the civil rights movement was a call for federal intervention. And when we think about what that means, what the passage of the Civil Rights Act means, what the passage of the Voting, right Act, right, Voting Rights Act means, it was an idea that once we gain access to all of these things, that we would get equality and equity through those means. What happens after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is really kind of the last legal barrier to our rights is we're looking at the same time as the Voting Rights Act is passed, it, what's happening predominantly in urban centers. So 1965 also marks the Watts riots, right? The Watts uprising. As we're celebrating our right to vote, if we think about the conditions of black people in urban centers, right? Like Watts, California, we understand that the system of policing is descending upon Black urban communities, right? So you see the beating of Marquette Fry and his mama and his brother and the criminalization of an entire community. So 1965 calls on us to do something else. 1965, you know, is the year that Malcolm X is, is life is stolen, right? 1965 reminds us that it's about more than access to the system. It's about recognizing that the system is fundamentally unjust. And so this is not about 
getting the system to be equal or equ even equitable for all people. This is about fundamental transformation. It's about recognizing that these systems are moving exactly as they were designed to. And so we need to think about how to change that. So as Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale are community college students, and I share this often with my students at Cal State LA, that they were community college students and they were actually ret returning students. They were non-traditional students, right? Who are students at Merritt College in the community college district in Oakland, California, who are talking about what's happening in this moment. And they say, we have to do something. And they get together and they actually engage community. And they say, what is it that you need? What is it that we must do as black people? And the number one issue that comes out of Oakland, specifically the West Oakland community that they were surveying is, we have to push back against police brutality. We have to end the violence that we're experiencing at the hands of the police. And so as they stepped into this notion of black power, a notion that had been chanted by student leaders and organizations like Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commi Committee and people like Kwame Ture, who were chanting black power, right? They're actually saying, well, what is black power? How do we define it? And so this is how Huey P. Newton defines power. Power is the ability to define phenomena and to make these ph phenomena act in a desired manner, to make these phenomena act in a desired manner. And so when we think about this moment that we're in, the current black power moment, what it means to be in a Black Lives Matter movement moment. We have to think about how we're defining phenomena, how we're defining the murder of George Floyd, right? We know that the state attempted to define the murder of George Floyd in a particular way, right? The state, oops, the state attempted to tell us that George Floyd died from cardiopulmonary arrest and he was positive for COVID-19 and that's what killed him. We saw even before that the police department put out a statement that says that George Floyd died, a man dies of medical complications. And it wasn't the system that was truthful and honest. It wasn't the system that honored the life of George Floyd but it was the masses that honored the life of George Floyd and got this Chauvin verdict just yesterday. We see here on the left, Derek Chauvin being led out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Um, and I think that many of us, and I wanna invite you to share your experiences. I just wanna share that my experience was that although I've invested the last eight years of my life in heeding my sacred duty and many years even before that in heeding my sacred duty, but intentionally for the last almost eight years through Black Lives Matter, as we rallied for and won a verdict, I still was reticent to invest hope in this. Right, I was reticent to be hopeful. I, um, we've experienced too much. And even though we witnessed the nine minute, nine minute and 29 second video that Darnella Frazier, that courageous 17 year old girl um, who should have never been subjected to the trauma that she was subjected to, but st stood fearlessly and courageously and said, I at least have to take this video, right? I still thought, of <clears throat> thought about the fact that there have been hundreds of videos of black people being killed by police. And even though I saw 
the spirits of the slave catchers whose tradition Derek Chauvin was invoking as he ground down into the neck of George Floyd with his knee. I didn't dare to hope because I saw the videos of many other deaths. I saw the video of the murder of Philando Castile. I saw the video of the murder of Dijon Kizzy. I saw the video of the murder of Walter Scott. I saw the video of the murder of Christopher DeAndre Mitchell and Albert Ramon Dorsey and so many others, Oscar Grant and so many others. And so I didn't allow myself to be hopeful. And when asked what I thought the verdict would be, I said to myself and to others that no matter what the verdict, the entire system is guilty. And I still believe that, that no matter what the verdict, the entire system is guilty. But it does mean something. It does mean something that Derek Chauvin was found guilty. It does mean something that he's facing up to 75 years in prison. It does mean something to my heart and to my spirit that couldn't contain itself as I sat on the couch with my children and cheered and hugged them and embraced them and felt a moment of joy and thanks and gratefulness for my community that rallied for this outcome. And it means something not only to me, but to the masses of Black people. And I just want us to watch as we know it wasn't just me. for is taking it to the next level and the next level in terms of getting our freedom. It's that sense of relief that was described and yet a sense that there is still a lot more justice. So I want us to check in for a moment and um, I also want to give us permission in this class to understand that Black power moves from many different spaces. Um, I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment. That black power moves from many different spaces. Black power is not just about our intellect. Black power is not just about our organizing. Black power is about embracing our emotions. Black power is about capturing our spiritual tools and utilizing them. Black power is about all of that. So as I just watched this compilation of what we experienced yesterday, I'm becoming emotional. And I want to invite you to share what you felt as you heard that verdict, but also what you feel in this moment. Do we have folks who are willing to share? You can share in the chat and we'll be happy to read it. Or if you want to get on camera and share, just raise your hand. And we much prefer the camera, much prefer the camera so we can feel you. We have- All right, I'm gonna move over Celia. Apologies if I'm saying that incorrectly. And so as you come on camera, if you could just introduce yourself before you share, that would be great. Hold on, I'm trying to also, um, yeah, here we go. Hi, Celia. Celia from Los Angeles. And, um, you know, as a white person, I also, I mean, I just felt the camera doesn't lie. Uh, you know, the, the video did not lie. And I think for, for myself, it opened up a brutality that I know has been there intellectually, 
but to actually see it in front of me as if it was happening right in front of me was was really really intense and so i just allowed myself i allowed myself to feel hope because the jury came back so fast but still i was filled with incredible dread because so much of the time police officers are not found guilty they may be convicted but then they're not found guilty and so I wasn't so I wasn't so sure, but I felt that I was also with my daughter, and I just hugging and kissing her, uh, you know. And and it it did feel like a huge relief, but it's also just one step in a just a long, long journey that we're taking. And I hope to God it's it's it marks some kind of a change. Thank you, Celia. Who else do we have with raised hands? Thank you so much for sharing. I'll read what Daryl James wrote since he didn't raise his hand and I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna read it for him. He said, I was born and raised six blocks from the intersection of 38th and Chicago and Minneapolis where George was killed. Having left Minneapolis in the year 2000 at the age of 18, and for having never moved back for reasons I could never quite articulate, this all brought to light what I felt and knew was true. And sadly, that was the fact that Minneapolis, in particular my community, was and is a hopeless place for Black people in many ways. As much as I feel relief that the justice system worked as it should in this case, that feeling is lost in part as I feel a sense of guilt still for abandoning that community to this day. Mm. Mm. And what was his name? Daryl James. <clears throat> Daryl, thank you for sharing that, Daryl. Anybody else want to share? We can take one more. If you want to share, please raise your hand. So I just want us to sit with those feelings just a bit. If we have feelings, I want us to process what those feelings are, whether they be rage or relief or hope or joy. You know, I felt, I guess, a bit of what Daryl was feeling and that I felt a little guilty for being joyful in the moment, um, for feeling a sense momentarily um, of almost elation. And um, I felt guilty for it, but then at a certain point, I had to allow myself to feel what I was feeling, right? To um, say that, you know, these moments of joy um, are okay. And this is why, this is why, that it wasn't. Up or not, take your knee up or not. Oops, it wasn't um, the system that moved itself, right? It was the people that moved the system. It was the people that moved the system that all around the globe, tens of millions of people rose up making Black Lives Matter the largest racial and social justice movement in global history. We risked our lives in the midst of a pandemic to say that there's another pandemic that we have to counter. And that is the pandemic of policing that is stealing the lives of our people. And so the joy, the relief that I was feeling, the sense of gratitude that I felt wasn't for the prosecution. It wasn't for the policing system that now is trying to cast uh, Derek Chauvin as simply a bad apple. Right, we know that that's a lie. We know that Derek Chauvin was a training officer. You all gave the nod to him. We know that three other officers stood there and watched and protected Derek Chauvin as he stole the life of George Floyd, right? We know that the Minneapolis Police Department has been corrupt, as has every other police department in this country, right? We know that the system of policing 
tales from slave catching. And we know that as we talk about the system of policing, it's one part of a larger criminal legal system that seeks to incarcerate and dehumanize and steal the lives of black people. So the sense of joy and hope and faith and relief and gratitude that we're feeling that I think many of us felt was not about the system working as it should. It's about the system being forced to give some semblance of justice in the name of George Floyd. And that came from the power of the people that came as gratitude for Darnella Frazier and her nine-year-old cousin. It came as gratitude for the brother who said, yeah, I called him a bum. Is that, did you hear me say it 27 times? Then I said it 27 times, right? It came from the elder who dared to cry on the witness stand and shed tears in the name of George Floyd. Our sense of gratitude and faith and hope is about recognizing that this means something. Off our necks. Take your knee off our necks. Take your knee off Curfew was ordered, the city became a war zone. After attempting to breach television studios, large groups torched police cruisers as officers fired back with rubber bullets. Minneapolis today, with its charred remnants of last night's rioting, the fury evident at... They called it a riot. We know it was an uprising. We know that here in Los Angeles, we had marches with as many as a hundred to 150,000 people in the streets. We know that as the news attempts to frame it as protesters engaging in violence, that property destruction is not the violence. The violence is the theft of black life. We know that police, even as we were protesting police violence, proved our point by engaging in such a violent manner that we had to get a restraining order against LAPD. We need to be clear that what we celebrate is the power of the people. And what we have faith in is the power that is signified in this moment, that this is not just about sending Derek Chauvin to prison, right? And good, I'm glad he's going to prison because as long as there are prisons, and I'm an abolitionist, start it with that, but as long as there are prisons, the police who kill our people should be the first ones in them, right? But this is not just about Derek Chauvin. It's about what we can win through the power of the people. Black power is about recognizing that everything is on the table, that we can usher in a world of our most radical imaginings. And so I wanna call you, what this class is about is calling you into the new iteration of the Black Power Movement. And there's ways in which you can engage. And so I just wanna close with some tangibles. This is about the intellectual work that we must do. It's about the voice that you have to raise. It's about putting your bodies on the line. It's about sharing your resources. And these are some ways in which you can do it. After we finish this today, I'm gonna be out in the streets. Tyler's gonna be with me and many others are gonna be at our end police associations rally. Every Wednesday, we rally for justice in the name of those who were stolen by police, were met by many of those families. Today, we're gonna uplift the name of Daniel Hernandez and we're also going to be reminding us that it was the Minneapolis Police Association that paid for the um, defense of Derek Chauvin. It was the Brooklyn Center Police Association that dared to make Kim Potter, who stole the life of Dante Wright, their president. And so we'll be there on uh, today and every Wednesday at three o'clock. Tonight, We'll be talking about budgets. So when we say defund the police, that's what we mean, defund the police. And so how do we do that? Um, we'll be engaging online. You're welcome to join us tonight at seven o'clock. Every single Thursday night at seven o'clock, we have a political education session. This Thursday, we'll have Nakima Levy Armstrong, who is an organizer from Minneapolis, is a brilliant attorney 
from Minneapolis, along with one of the most brilliant law professors, legal scholars on this planet, Jody Armour, whose book is recommended reading for this class. And then finally, on Sunday, if you're in Los Angeles, please join us as we march in the name of George Floyd and recognizing that Derek Chauvin was a step in the right direction, but does not mean justice. We have to continue to rally for justice. Things you can do real quick, and I think all of this is gonna be shared, is we're doing a People's Budget LA survey. How do you want your tax dollars to be spent? This is only for Angelinos, so please complete that survey as, if you can. Finally, we're trying to get rid of the police chief who signed off, who gave direct orders around the beatings and brutality of our people at the hands of police as we rose up over the last year in the name of George Floyd. We want him fired. Anyone, anywhere, no matter where you are, can sign this petition at tinyurl.com slash firelapd chief more. Here's people to follow and ways to plug in. Um, on Monday mornings, Tyler B and I have a radio show. You're welcome to tune in. Here's people to follow on social media, um, organizations to follow on social media. And we want to pause there as we close up our first session of our Black Power class. So I know that we had some comments from social venture partners um, before we leave this session and move into the next for next week. Remember to pick up those books. Black Power is the one that we're reading now. Please don't buy it from Amazon. Go to your local black owned bookstore to get Black Power by Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah. Um, so again, welcome thank, and thank you all so much for this first session, uh, one of eight. Um, so just really quickly to close before we wrap and, and move, I just wanted to uh, share quickly just a couple things that will be coming. Um, you will receive an email letting you know that when everything is up on the website so that you can look, that will include the transcript, the recording of the video, um, and is there something else that's going to be in that email? Something else, but yeah, so that- A list of all the resources yes. that Dr. Yes. and the syllabus in the as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the syllabus as well, that'll all be there. And then just so you know, we made the decision that next week, once we are back in, we won't be in this webinar uh, feature, we'll be actually being able to see faces so that you all be able to engage a little bit quicker and everything like that. So just be prepared to, and, and know that that's coming uh, so that we can be really in community as Dr. Abdullah was mentioning. Um, and I think that's all, Yolanda, do you have anything? Nope, oh, thanks for joining us. Awesome. And if you have any questions, our email address is in the Zoom invites, but it's info at SVPLA. If you have any questions, just let us know. Yeah, yes, sure Denise, do your hair. That This is the first time that I have touched my hair this week. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all, thank awesome. you all. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Pro Bono ASL. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Pro Bono ASL, love y'all. Yeah.